Jesus, sweet Jesus, here in this quiet place, I bow before you, I've come to seek your face, beholding your glory, I kneel before your throne. Crying, holy, holy, I worship you, oh Lord. And I will lift up holy hands in the presence of my King. So lift up holy hands right now right now men let's seek him let's go after god right now lift up those hands father we ask you oh god bring your power your anointing your spirit upon us right now oh father we glorify your name we glorify your name we worship you we worship you we worship you oh god fill us oh god with your spirit 
Fill us, O oh God, with your word. Mold us and make us into the men that you want us to be, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Boy, powerful preaching this morning. It's everything I can do to keep it in me. I, I got to wait till Friday, you know, before I can get up and share my heart with you. But I want to tell you right now, we got a man coming up that's going to bless our socks off. It's a man of God, Sam Farina. I've known of Sam and known Sam for many years, but I, I first met him at Calvary Church in Naperville. Came there and just, just blessed me. He goes around speaking across this country as an evangelist. He's in many men's camps and retreats and encouraging men and speaking to men's heart. And when we started putting this conference together, I immediately, in conferring with Pastor Kilpatrick, I said, I think we need to reach out for Sam Farina to bring a word, a fresh word to the men. And so this morning, it's just my pleasure, it's my uh, honor to have Sam come and minister the word to us this morning. Let's welcome Sam Farina. Is it green? That's it. Don't you love all this? There is no greater group that I'd rather speak to than men. I was with 7,000 young people up in Canada just a few days ago, and they were excited, and they were pumped, and it was great to see a 1,000 of them come to Christ. Amen. But I'm going to tell you what has happened in my life in still being able to speak to young people. I don't speak to them anymore from the same place. Now I speak to them as a father. And you ought to see them respond because they're so hungry for a dad that'll talk with them. My son is 19, he's in South America right now. He's been there for three weeks, he's work, working with a missionary there. And, and now when I stand in front of young people and I say to them, I've come to speak to you as a father. It's interesting because their response is incredible. We had something happen while we were there. I, the father of Jason Lang, now most of you in this room don't recognize that name, Jason Lang, because Jason Lang went to school one week after the Colorado Columbine massacre in Tabor, Alberta, Jason Lang, 17 years old, goes to school, walks around the corner of a hallway in his school, and a young man who had put on a trench coat like those two young men in Columbine had gone to his school with a gun there in Canada, wheeled around, fired shots into those two students, one Jason Lang, as they walked around the corner, and Jason was struck in the chest and died in a matter of minutes. And Jason's dad stood in front of those 7,000 young people on Sunday, right before I was to speak. And that man is full of God's spirit and a pastor of one of our churches. 
And he told those students how he went to his son's school. And he prayed over the very spot where his son had been murdered and came against every foul spirit and how he'd been leading teachers and students to Christ since that event. And then his mom got up and prayed for the family and prayed for that young 14-year-old that had killed their son. And the forgiveness that flowed from them made it very easy for me to talk to those students about forgiveness and laying down the hatred and the bitterness. Let me tell you something, my friend. Star Wars has one thing right. They have one thing right. Anger leads to hatred, and hatred leads to the dark side. And there were so many young people that responded to forgive parents and people. It was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. And in just a moment, what we are going to do is we are going to do what Richard talked about earlier when he spoke to you. We are going to pray. We are going to do the highest calling that we can do. We are going to pray for our wives and our children. I pray if there's anyone in this room that is not, that is holding anger and hatred and unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart that you will lay it down today because there's some that have that towards your wife. And when Richard talked about his wife and said that she looked at him and said, I don't know if I love you anymore, some of you inside, instead of there being a response of empathy, you had a response of anger and you said, I've heard it so much. but you need to lay it down today. And some of you have had it out with your kids and their teenagers. And that illustration that Richard used of that 15-year-old who said, yeah, we'll see about that. That's the way it's been with your teenager. And every time you see each other, it's a blow up. But this morning, you're going to learn the greatest principle of all, and that is the principle of investment. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So when you begin to put investment of prayer into that son and into that wife, and you begin to sacrifice something that costs you something for them, you're going to find that the anger and the bitterness cannot stay. And there will be a new love that will come into your life. There are some of you here this morning that have never been converted. You listened to Randy last night, and you listened to Richard this morning, and now you're sitting here listening to me, but you've never been genuinely converted. Oh, maybe you've gone to church, but some of you haven't even done that. Some of you have been invited by others to come and you've never been converted. And in a moment, you're going to be genuinely converted. You're going to come and discover what it is to serve Jesus as you surrender to him. I like the tent that's out here with all the different things, and there are some things that I won't have time to share with you about. Richard talked about conscience. And let me tell you something, folks. We don't hear much about conscience today. It's interesting because Paul told Timothy, if you don't have a good conscience, you're going to suffer shipwreck. Yet I am yet to be in a church that has a regular class on development of conscience. But yet, Paul said, if you don't have a good conscience, you will suffer shipwreck. Amen. And so we put together a whole series on conscience. What is it? How do you develop it? It's out there in the tent. I encourage you to get it. And this series on refathered man, and I bear my whole being with you here as far as integrity. How do you become men of integrity? And in those personal areas of your life, and they're back there. And then this book, 
I brought with me and I want you to get, and it's with the series that are back there, and it's called Pure Desire. And let me tell you something, man. If there is a book, and I will use it in just a moment, and what I'm going to share with you, if there is a book that I feel very, very strongly about, it is this one, because it deals with the area of how to be free. Not just, listen, it's not just, some of you came to the altar last night wanting to be free, but you need more than what happened at this altar. Now you need to go home and quit trying to be free and start training, training. Listen, if I asked you, young man, to go out and run a 26-mile marathon, could you do it? No, you could not. But if I worked with you for a month, could you and I both do it? Well, yes, we could. Because we would train until we could do it. And the kingdom of God is not about trying. The kingdom of God is about training. Paul said to Timothy, you train like a gymnast. You get in the gymnasium of God's Word. You train and you become like Christ. Listen, you can come to this altar and God can do marvelous things, but if you don't train, you're going back. You'll go back. You must train. And I encourage you, because this is a marvelous tool, and I love tools. Richard talked about communication. How many, how many really know we do have some problems with communication? I like, I like being a guy, though, don't you? How many are glad you're guys? I am. I'm going to tell you something. Being a guy means a phone conversation is over in 30 seconds. Oh. I love being a guy. It means I can take a five-day trip with one suitcase. It's true. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'm convinced that being a guy, if, if you guys who aren't married, this is wonderful because when you're a guy and you're planning a wedding, you realize that all that stuff can take care of itself. And, and I'll tell you what, Chuck, you and I are glad we're guys because gray hair and wrinkles is a look of distinction. <laughs> you know what's neat about being a guy? If another guy shows up wearing the same outfit you're wearing, you become lifelong friends. <laughs> That's true. And, and I'll tell you what, you, you, this, being a guy means one hairdo all your life is good enough. <laughs> being a guy means you get your nails done with a pocket knife. <laughs> and the best thing I like about being a guy is Christmas shopping can be done on December 24th for 25 relatives in 45 minutes. Now, there are some problems with being a guy when it comes to communication. See, some of you in this room keep going, I don't understand the woman. I've been married 25 years. And... Randy just informed me there. He said, you know, you're the oldest speaker on the whole thing. <laughs> so I didn't get water to drink. I got it to pour on him. <laughs> Let me help you with your wife's language. When your wife says, it's your decision, that means the correct decision has already been made obvious. I want to help you. How many think we should be practical? When your wife says, do whatever you want, 
That means you'll pay later. <laughs> when your wife says to you, you're so manly today, that means you need a shave and you smell funky. <laughs> when your wife says to you, this kitchen is inconvenient, that means you're buying a new house. <laughs> Whatever my wife says to me, hang the picture there. That means, no, over there, wait a minute, over there. <laughs> I remember when my son was little and my wife would say, was that the baby? <laughs> that meant, if you don't get up, get out of this bed and walk over there, you're not sleeping the rest of the night. <laughs> there are some things I wish my wife understood. Don't you? I mean, like, hey, if Christo Christopher Columbus didn't need directions, then why do I? I wish my wife understood that most guys own two, maybe three pairs of shoes, so why do I have to pick out of the 30 which one looks best with the dress? I know that guy's wife. I can relate to that. <laughs> How many wish women knew if they have a question that they don't want an answer to, they shouldn't expect to, us to answer it? <laughs> of course, women could use a little help with what we say. Like, I'll get right to it. <laughs> that means within the next month or so. Or the little phrase, do you want a snack? That's us asking, will you get up and get me one? I know you guys. I know, I know, I know some of you guys. I'm listening, dear, means I've already read the paper, watched the news, and I haven't heard a word you said. I love the little phrase men use, it's for the family. That means I've always wanted one of these. <laughs> you know what every man expected of his wife when he got married? She'd always be beautiful and cheerful. Every man in the room thinks she could have married a movie star, but she wanted only me. That she has hair that never needs curlers or beauty shops. She never gets sick, just allergic to jewelry and fur coats. <laughs> then she insists that moving the furniture by herself is good for her figure. That she's an expert cook cleans the house, fixes the car, the TV, paints the house, and keeps quiet. <laughs> that her favorite hobbies are mowing the lawn and shoveling the snow. <laughs> that she hates charge cards. Her favorite expression is, what can I do for you, dear? She thinks you have Einstein's brains, that you look like Mr. America. She wishes you would go out with the guys so she could get some sewing done. <laughs> and that she loves you just because you're good looking. But what you expected and what you got may be two different things. For some, she speaks 140 words a minute with gusts up to 180.
For some, she once was a model for a totem pole. She's a light eater. As soon as it gets light, she starts eating now. For some, where there's smoke, there she is cooking. She lets you know you only have two faults, everything you say and everything you do. No matter what she does, her hair looks like an explosion in a steel wool factory. The last time she used a broom was to fly somewhere. If she gets lost, you just open your wallet and she finds you. And she fights with the neighbors just to keep in shape for you. I tell you that in a humorous way because we laugh, but for a lot of us, it's not like it once was in our relationship. Some of the dreams have burst. Some of you have reached the place where your kids have left home and you found yourself looking at a stranger. I was standing with a group of men in North Dakota some years ago, and I shared what I'm about to share, just a little brief thing that I'm just gonna give you here. And a 70-year-old man stood up and he said, I brought my wife flowers. And she said to me, she said, Honey, I, I, I love the flowers, but I wish I could just have five minutes to just talk with you. And then he looked at the group of men and he said, that was, I'm going to go home and I'm going to give her that five minutes because he said that request for five minutes was five years ago. And I didn't have to say a whole lot after that. You see, some of you think gifts or jewelry or flowers, but I'm going to tell you something. Those are mostly apologies. The only true gift is when you give part of yourself. When you give her the gift of your heart, just write that down. Say heart. Say it again. When you give her the gift of your heart, you say, what are gifts of the heart? Kindness, understanding, forgiveness, commitment, gifts of your heart. Listen to me, sir. I don't care if you go to Gold's Gym. Your wife is not turned on by your naked body. Oh, she may try to make you feel that way. God bless her. But I'm going to tell you what turns a woman on the gift of your naked emotions when you give your heart when you give her the gift of your mind say mind the memories, the ideas, the plans. How long has it been since you sat with your wife and you dreamed and you laid out some plans together? And you shared those dreams with her. When you give her the gift of your spirit, say spirit. spirit. The gift of your spirit. What is that? That's prayer, vision, faith, and direction. And can I tell you the number one thing after 25 years of marriage that I've found more men battle with than anything else in their marriages, and that is praying with their wife. It's a battle, men. It's a battle. How long has it been since you found your wife crying and there was no reason she was crying and she didn't even know why she was crying and you just took her in your arms and you cried with her just because she was crying. How 
How long has it been since you held her in bed? As tears ran down her face over something stupid. We just had to put our dog to sleep. I mean, you know what I'm saying. The dog just reached that point. But I'm going to tell you something. My wife cried. So I cried. Jeremy. When's the last time you gave her the gift of your words? Say words. words. Encouragement, praise, inspiration, creativity. Let me tell you something, guys. There's not a one of you in this room that likes when your boss calls, looks at you and says, you did, what's the matter with you? And then you go home, you say, well, and you know what? We say the same things to our wives and to our kids. How long has it been? I love little kids. I love little kids. I, I, I could just, and I'll tell you when I love little kids the best. It's when they've just had a bath and you put them in the little footed pajamas and they get in bed, you know, and they're all, and you go in there and when they, if you get in there when they just had the bath and little footed pajamas and you get them in bed, they will tell you everything. I'm telling you, I've stayed at people's homes, man. I found out things about Randy Ruiz and blow you away. And I just sit on his little kid's bed and I say, well, tell me more. <laughs> and they just pop, 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 I say, oh. <laughs> Great men of God. Oh, you ought to hear their little kids. <laughs> Let me tell you something about teenagers. They don't change just because they became teenagers. You go to their bedroom right before they're ready to turn in and you knock on the door. I said you knock on the door. You don't walk in. You respect them and you knock on the door. And you go in you just sit there on the edge of their bed. They'll probably faint. They'll think they did something wrong. But I'm going to tell you something. They want to tell you about their day. They want to talk to you. They want you to listen. They want some encouragement. They want some praise. Richard said it so well. He said, if you want to know about me, check out my kids. If you want to know my dad, hang around me. My dad died three years ago in 1996. He was incredible. I'm going to give you five keys that my father gave me. I'm going to give them to you. I've given them to my son and, and to see my boy who's just finished his first year of university and launch to go and just wants to be in ministry and he's down in South America. He'll fly home the end of next week and he'll leave for six weeks of youth camps traveling with his own group that he's put together to do drama at youth camps. And, and, and people say, well, why in the world after his first year of, of, uh, of Bible college would he do that? Why would he do that? Why would he, why would he go and travel for six weeks and not come home and sit around with lemonade and, and around the pool or something? And, and, and it's because when he was two weeks old, he did his first youth camp with dad. And he's done youth camps every summer all his life. So you see, he's just being reproduced. Because there's nothing greater than to be around altars with teenagers, see them touched and converted and changed. There's nothing greater. 
Let me tell you something, Dad. You need to put your arm around your son every day and your daughter every day, and you need to tell them how much you, how, how good they're doing and what's, what, how much you love them and how they look just like their mother, thank God. My dad was the best at it. I never came home from a meeting that my dad did not pick up the phone in his office and call me. I knew he was the first call when I'd get in town. How was the meeting? How did it go? When you coming by? And I'd go by his office and he always had time. My dad owned his own business, but he always had time. It didn't matter what was going on. It didn't matter what was happening. He was proud to introduce me to everybody in town. Everyone he did business with, he took me with him. He took me with and he introduced me to this one and that one and the other. Have you ever introduced your kid to your boss? Let me tell you something. Charles Plum was a naval. Academy graduate, fighter pilot in Vietnam, flew 75 combat missions. And then his plane was destroyed on the 76th mission by an air, surface-to-air missile. He ejected, parachuted into enemy hands, was captured, spent six years in a communist prison. He survived the ordeal, and one day, when he and his wife were sitting in a restaurant, a man at another table came up to him and said, you're plumb. You flew fighters in Vietnam from the Kitty Hawk and you were shot down. Plum looked at him and said, how in the world did you know that? He said, I packed your parachute the day you were shot down. Charles Plum stood up, threw his arms around him and hugged him. And the man looked at him and said, I just wanted to shake your hand. And he walked away. Charles Plum sat down in a dead stare and his wife said, what is wrong? That night he couldn't sleep. And he, his wife woke up and said, Charles, what is wrong? He said, I walked around the Kitty Hawk, the captain, the pilot. He said, I could have cared less what that guy looked like. I could have cared less as he walked by in his bell-bottom trousers. He said, I could have cared less about anything about that guy because I was the pilot. But he said, today I realized that without that guy packing my parachute right, I wouldn't be here today. Let me tell you something, man. You need to go home and you need to thank that woman that packed your parachute so you could be here today. You need to put your arms around your kids and say, I love you and I'll always love you. My dad was a master at it. He was a master. I, I don't apologize for my tears today. I, I'm telling you, he, he was so good. He, he, he literally, he would get us to do things, work, literal work. He would get us to do it. And we would think we were teaching him something when we were doing it. <laughs> he was that good. He was that good. I'm telling you. He taught me five simple things, and I just want to give you a verse of Scripture here, and then I'm going to give them to you, and I'm not going to speak long because I told you we were going to pray, and I told you that some of you were going to come to salvation. Some of you have never been asked. Some of you have been asked, but you've never understood the change that living for Jesus Christ can make in your life. My father was an Italian businessman. Uh, uh, let me tell you something. He wasn't just an Italian businessman. He was an Italian car dealer. 
Now, I'm going to tell you what, if God can save an Italian car dealer, how many know he can save any one of you in this room? <laughs> My father owned his own dealership, and I'm going to tell you what. One day when a guy was speaking just like I was, and gave the invitation to come to Jesus, a little woman who was in that room whose mom had abandoned her when she was eight years old. Her father had been injured in a wreck and had left the house at about when she was three. She had crossed the United States from Pennsylvania to Wisconsin to find her newly married sister, and her sister said, we can't keep you. She was bounced from foster home to foster home, and at age Two days after her 16th birthday, got a judge to sign an agreement to allow her to marry some guy. And she got married and 18th birthday, had her little baby boy. Now life all messed up from all the luggage and baggage and garbage and junk that she carried into that relationship. And many of us have carried baggage. And she came to that church and there was an invitation given to come and surrender to Jesus Christ. And she stepped out and she went home that night having found Jesus and she said to her husband you got to come with me tomorrow night and he came and let me tell you something that man and that woman was my mom and my dad and my dad came that next night Italian businessman stepped out of his seat he said I can't tell you a word that ma that man spoke but he said something gripped me and it's the same thing that's gripping some of you in this room today it's the conviction of the love of the Holy Spirit of God it's the love of Jesus Christ grabbing your heart today you have not come by accident you've come by appointment just like my dad did and when he surrendered his life to Jesus our home was never the same never the same he changed. And here's why he changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want you to see this. Beginning at verse 1. Paul is saying something here that my dad figured out. And when he figured it out, he passed it on down. My grandfather came the same week in that same meeting when my mom and my dad were converted and my grandfather was converted. My grandfather came from Italy. My grandfather was hauling sugar for Capone during the Prohibition days and, and was, a, was a true Italian, I mean, a true Italian. When you hear the pictures, that's the picture. But when he came to Jesus Christ, his hands were huge. He, he, he carried himself with such pride. But when he came to Jesus, he was so changed by the power of God. Six of his kids ended up in full-time ministry. They were all adults at the time, but there was such a change in his life. They were changed, and they ended up in ministry. Now grandkids and great-grandkids. Let me tell you something. Conversion will change the future of your family. Here's what dad and granddad realized. I went at 81 to see my grandfather. He was living in Hobbs, New Mexico at the time. Health had kind of been doing him wrong and he'd had a heart attack. He'd had some cancer surgery. And uh, 81 years old, I went there to hold the meeting in his hometown. And he wasn't home when I got there. And I said to my grandmother, where's grandpa? And she said, he's out soliciting. He's calling on every house in the neighborhood, inviting them to the meeting tonight. I said, he doesn't drive, Grandma. How's he going to get all these people there? He's telling them you're picking them up. <laughs> it was hot. If you've ever been in Hobbs, it's dry, it's hot, it's dusty. And I went and found him, and I said, Grandpa, you shouldn't be out here 81. I said, your health isn't that good. I said, he looked at me, he pointed his finger at me. He said, listen, for 47 years, 
I solicited for my business. He owned his own business. He said, if you think I can't give the rest of my life to do it for Jesus. Every night after church, Chuck, my grandfather never missed an altar call. Didn't matter what they preached on. Preached to little women, he'd respond. <laughs> you know why? He said this, he said, he said, life's too dirty and you pick up a lot of dirt. You need to get in the bath. But you know what he'd do every night we'd get home? I'd finish preaching, we'd pray for everybody there was, he'd be in the altar, we'd get home, he'd make a cup of coffee and a graham cracker. Here. You down the coffee, eat the graham cracker, then you're awake. He'd say, now we'll pray. We've just been in church. Imagine last night, you would have had to go home, pray with Grandpa some more. It's the way it worked. What did they discover? Look at this. And I, brethren, this is Paul speaking, could not speak to you as a spiritual people, but I had to speak to you as carnal, as babes in Christ. Now, let me tell you something, my friend. There are some of you that respond to altars, and you responded last night, but you know what? You're still babes in Christ because you haven't moved on to the training aspect that I talked about earlier. See, you can be a Christian, and you can be on your way to heaven, but you can be carnal. Now, watch this. Watch this. This is so incredible. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal, for where, where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like, say those next two words. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. I have heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it. Well, we're just human. No, we are not mere men. My father drilled that and drilled it by his life and his example. And my grandfather did the same. We are not mere men. We are not mere men. We are not mere men. Once you come to Jesus Christ, you are not mere men. That's over. We just stepped up. Don't, don't leave yourself as mere men. Let me tell you something, mere men have made a mess out of everything they've touched. I mean, they just don't get it. Mere men don't get it. They, they, they're still, it's still the same mess a hundred years ago we fought in Kosovo and the Balkans in World War I over the same issue that we're still fighting over today. This is not something new, gang. This is the same thing we fought over a hundred years ago. Why? Because those are mere men. And don't, don't, and I'm going to say this, I should leave this alone, but I'm going to say it. Someone came to me and said, wait a minute, that group that we're defending is Muslim and the Serbs are Christian. My friend, they are no more Christian than the man on the moon. You listen to me. I'm done using the word Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And there is a difference. Just because you Christian by whatever baptism or whatever you went through or whatever church you attend does not mean you're a follower of Jesus. Some of you are acting like mere men. Paul says that's not what it's about. You say, well, what keeps us from being mere men? Write this down quickly. Number one is righteousness in our daily living. Righteousness in our daily living. 
Listen to this statement by Jesus. I love the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only who, who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now watch this, because folks, wait a minute. What kind of people is he describing here? They cast out demons, they prophesied, and they performed miracles. Say that again. My friend, not just so-called Christians, Look at the description, Don. These are Pentecostals. These are Charismatics. This is the Foursquare Assembly of God Vineyard Harvest. This is the group that believes in prophecy. This is the group that believes in the demons being set free and the miracles. Yet he says, I say to you, I know you not, and you are evildoers. Now that word evildoers translated in the English is the exact same word that is used for antichrist. Same word. You can do your word studies on it. I already did it. It's the same word as the word for Antichrist. In other words, you can be involved in ministry and God will honor his word with results. Not because you're living right, but because his word is right and his word works. You can have ministry and have results, but have the spirit of Antichrist. Well, what is the spirit of Antichrist? It's creating your own lifestyle and saying, that's all right. No, no, God says, if you're going to do my work, you better live my word. And let me tell you something. If you want to know the one, number one thing, and Richard uh, is here and, and, and Randy and others that work with young people will tell you this. If you want to know the one thing that's destroying more teenagers in the church and 80%, 80% of our kids never darken a door. I'm not talking about just AG kids. I'm talking about all church kids. 80% of all denominations never darken a church door after they leave for college. And then I'll tell you the number one reason. It's because they've had parents that have talked it but haven't walked it. The righteousness has not been there evident with what has been expected. And I'm not talking about weirdness, folks. I'm not to listen. My dad was not weird. Our house was not weird. I, my home was not weird. My, my son one day paid me the greatest compliment of all. He brought in a bunch of his young friends and they sat down in the family room. He said, Dad, you don't mind if my friends are here. I said, No, man, I don't care. Because our house as a boy was always open to every kid. My dad bought pinball machines, pool tables, put them in the basement. We had our own arcade before they had. Nintendo. That's what we had in the basement. Had a machine, you could slide a thing, and the, it was like bowling, but it was a machine. Dad invested in that, put it in the house. Every kid in the neighborhood wanted to be there. You think my mother had to worry where I was? Get smart, folks. Bring them in. He brought all his friends in, we were just, and he sat them down. He said, Dad, I told my friends you'd make them laugh. He couldn't, have, Chuck, he couldn't have said anything greater to me. Do you laugh around your house, folks? Guys, do you laugh at your house? Do your kids find it fun to be there? Do they find it fun to go on vacation with you? Is it fun to be around you? If it's not, it's time to start living the righteousness of the Lord because I'm going to tell you something. I got a feeling hanging with Jesus was fun. Barry, can you be, imagine Jesus and those guys? It was fun. Does your wife find you fun? Senior year, my son brought all his friends home after a play that they were in. They did 
some musical, and he brought them, he called up. He said, Dad, can I bring everybody from the cast to the house? I said, sure. I said, have they eaten? He said, no, but I said, I knew you'd, you'd, you'd get something together. We broke out sauce. You know, if you're Italian, you got frozen sauce in the freezer. We broke it out. We boiled the noodles. I made, I made beautiful bread pudding. My wife's making the spaghetti. I'm making the salad, and I'm making the bread pudding. We laid out a spread about 1 o'clock in the morning for those kids. You know what? I still see those kids on the street. You know what they say to me? Man, we can't wait to come to your house again. You say, what's that all about? What's the moral of that story? Make sauce and put it in the freezer. <laughs> don't, listen to, don't listen to Ruiz. He'll have you making tacos or something. Don't. <laughs> Can I share something with you? I was so proud last night to just sit out there in the audience, see Randy up here speaking to you guys. He traveled with me for eight months. When he was younger, he was just so cute and young. <laughs> and I knew God had his hand on his life. I can remember some of the days we laid in our motel room on the floor and just prayed. You need three things in your life, guys. You need a mentor, you need a disciple, and you need a partner. I don't care if you're in business, I don't care if you're pastoring a church, if you don't have a mentor, a disciple, and a partner, you're out of the will of God. You're imbalanced. That's what's happened here at this church with Steve Hill and John Gilpatrick. Partners. But they also have mentors and disciples. And those are different relationships. You need to teach your children that. Righteousness. 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 And your daily living will keep you from being a mere man. If you confuse doing God's will with being in God's will, you, will mis you, you have made a terrible mistake. It won't work. It won't work. Listen to me. Charisma without character equals catastrophe. Charisma without character equals catastrophe. Well, you say, what is righteousness? Well, let me just give you some quick verses, and then I'm going to move on. Matthew 6, 19, a lifestyle of materialism which lays up treasure on earth rather than in heaven is not righteousness. Now, you say, well, does that mean we shouldn't have material wealth? Absolutely not. You should have material wealth, and God says he will bless us and prosper us. But my friend, listen, you've got to drive a stake in the ground as to how you're going to live. You have got to drive a stake and say, I'm not going on any further. I'm not going to live any differently. This is as well as I'm going to live. This is the kind of car I'm going to drive and the kind of suit I'm going to wear. And this is the way we're going to live around our house. And you drive a stake in the ground and you say, that's it. Because let me tell you something. If you don't, you'll just keep wanting more and more and more. It's the way we were made. We've got this constant desire for more. Get a new car, you want a different one. Get a new house, you want a bigger one. But you drive a stake in the ground and you say, because of righteousness in my life, this is it. The Word of God says this, leaders who mistreat their fellow workers in the gospel, abusing them through harsh words and actions while they themselves live indulgently, it's not righteousness. That's from Matthew 24, 45. Titus 2.11 says, refusing to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, failing to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives while waiting for our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not righteousness. If you can't say no, say that word. No. Say it again. No. Say it again. No. Now listen. 
because this book has been a great help and I want to read from it. There was once a great and noble king whose land was terrorized by a crafty dragon. Like a massive bird of prey, the scaly beast delighted in ravaging villages with his fiery breath. Hapless victims ran from their burning homes only to be snatched into the dragon's jaws. Those devoured instantly were deemed more fortunate than those carried back to the dragon's lair to be devoured at his leisure. The king led his sons and knights in many valiant battles against the serpent. Riding alone in the forest, one of the king's sons heard his name purred low and soft. In the shadows of the ferns and trees curled among the boulders lay the dragon. The creature's heavy lid, lidded eyes fastened on the prince and the reptilian mouth stretched into a friendly smile. Don't be alarmed, said the dragon, as gray wisps of smoke rose lazily from his nostrils. I'm not what your father thinks. What are you then, asked the prince, drawing his sword as he pulled in the reins to keep his fearful horse from bolting. I am pleasure, said the dragon. Ride on my back and you will experience more than you have ever imagined. I have no harmful intentions. I seek a friend, someone to share flights with me. Have you never dreamed of flying? Never longed to soar in the clouds? Visions of soaring high above the forested hills drew the prince hastily from his horse. The dragon unfurled one great webbed wing to serve as a ramp, and he walked up on his ridged back. Between the spiny projections, the prince found a secure seat. Then the creature snapped his powerful wings twice and launched them into the sky. And the prince's apprehension melted into awe and exhilaration. From then on, he met the dragon often, but secretly. For how could he tell his father, brothers, or the knights that he had befriended the enemy? The prince felt separate from them all. Their concerns were no longer his concerns. Even when he wasn't with the dragon, he spent less time with those he loved and more time alone. The skin on the prince's legs became callous from gripping the ridged back of the dragon, and his hands grew rough and hardened. He began wearing gloves to hide the malady. After many nights of riding, he discovered scales growing on the backs of his hands as well. With dread, he realized his fate. Were he to continue, so he resolved not to return to the dragon again. But after two weeks, he again sought out the dragon. Having been tortured with desire, and so it transpired many times over, no matter what his determination, the prince eventually found himself pulled back as if by the cords of an invisible web. Silently, patiently, the dragon always waited. One cold, moonless night, their excursion became a foray against a sleeping village, torching the thatched roofs with fiery blasts from his nostrils. The dragon roared with delight when the terrified victims fled from their burning homes. Swooping in, the serpent belched again, and flames engulfed a cluster of screaming villagers. The prince closed his eyes tightly in an attempt to shut out the carnage. In the pre-dawn hours, when the prince crept back from his dragon trysts, the road outside his father's castle usually remained empty, but not tonight. Terrified refugees streamed into the streets. The prince attempted to slip through the crowd, but someone recognized him. He was there, one woman cried. I saw him on the back of the dragon. Others nodded their heads in anger. Horrified, the prince saw that his father, the king, was in the courtyard holding a bleeding child in his arms. The king's face mirrored the agony of his people as his eyes found the prince. The son fled, hoping to escape into the night, but the guards apprehended him as if he were a common thief. They brought him to the great hall where his father sat solemnly on the throne. The people on every side railed against the prince. Banish him! Burn him alive! As the king rose from his throne, bloodstains from the wounded shone darkly on his royal robes. The crowd fell silent in expectation of his decree. The prince, who could not bear to look into his father's face, stared at the flagstones of the floor. Take off your gloves and your tunic. The prince obeyed slowly, dreading to have 
his metamorphosis uncovered before the kingdom. Was his shame not already great enough? He had hoped for a quick death without further humiliation. Sounds of revulsion rippled through the crowd at the sight of the prince's thick scaled skin and the ridge growing along his spine. The king strode toward his son and the prince steeled himself, fully expecting a backhanded blow, even though he had never been struck by his father. Instead, his father embraced him and wept as he held him tightly. In shocked disbelief, the prince buried his face against his father's shoulder. Do you wish to be freed from the dragon, my son? The prince answered in despair, I wished it many times, but there is no hope for me. Not alone, said the king. You cannot win against the serpent alone. Father, I'm no longer your son. I'm half beast, sobbed the prince. But his father replied, my blood runs in your veins. My nobility has always been stamped deep within your soul. With his face still hidden tearfully in his father's embrace, the prince heard the king instruct the crowd. The dragon is crafty. Some fall victim to his wiles and some to his violence. There will be mercy for all who wish to be freed. Who else among you has ridden the dragon? The prince lifted his head to see someone emerge from the crowd. To his amazement, he recognized his older brother one who had been lauded throughout the kingdom for his onslaughts against the dragon. Others came, some weeping, others hanging their heads in shame. The king embraced them all. This is our most powerful weapon against the dragon, he announced. Truth! No more hidden flights! Alone, we cannot resist him. But together, we win. As the musicians come, some of you are saying you only gave us one of the five. It's true. You want to write the rest down real quick. Live risking everything for the kingdom. Risk will keep us from being mere men. Resolve will keep us from being mere men. Resolve to make it till the end. Reward. My friend, there is a reward that is going to be incredible in the end. It'll keep you from being a mere man. And reunion. I want you to hear me. One of these days, my whole family's getting together. My granddad, Sam one, my dad, Sam Jr., myself, Sam three, and my son, Sam four. All of our family is going to have a reunion one of these days. You know why we live the way we, we don't live as mere men? Because this life is just brief, but the reunion is forever. Chuck. You imagine the first meeting of the whole church was in one room, 120. By the next day, they had grown by 3,000 and they couldn't fit in one room. And the church has never been together since. But there's coming a day when all the church is going to get together in a reunion. And I don't know about you. But I want every one of my family there. Some of you, when that banner came out last night for families, you bowed your head in your hands and you began to sob. I watched you. 
I purposely sat out in the crowd because your family's not serving God. They need someone that will live righteous and risk everything for the kingdom. Risk it all. That's what Cassie Barnell did. Two years ago, that kid wasn't serving God, but at a youth retreat, surrendered it all to Jesus. And a little over a month ago at Columbine High School, when Eric D. Bold held that gun in her face and said, do you believe in God? She said, yes. He blew her away. But the testimony of one of the other girls who lived is even more dramatic. She'd been shot seven times. And Eric Diebold drew his gun on her for the eighth time. Seven bullet holes in her body. And he said, do you believe in Jesus now? And she said, yes. And for the eighth time, she was shot, but she lived. And in an interview with Time Magazine was asked, why did you say yes when you knew you'd be shot again? She said, because I believed I'd stand before him in a moment. some of you that if the gun was held in your head you're not sure you'd stand there you yourself are not sure you'd be at the reunion I use the word reward but you're not sure what your reward would be and in righteousness You find yourself lacking, but the king stands here today and he says, come. He's not going to give you a backhand. Maybe that's what your dad gave you when you were growing up, but that's not what the king will give you. He's going to embrace you because with truth comes victory. Jesus said, if you would come honestly and humble yourself before me, the truth will set you free. Today, there are men that have been invited. There are men that have come. And now I'm going to ask you to come and surrender to Jesus. I'm not asking you to go to this church or a church like this. You may go home and go to another church. That's okay. It's not church or religion that I'm talking about today. It's coming to Jesus just like my dad and my granddad and just like I did and just like my son did. We must come as individuals. We must come and stand before the king in truth and say, I've been sneaking out, king. I've been sneaking out, dad. I've been riding the dragon. I've been doing things that I don't even want to talk about sometimes and that I hate myself. But I want to be honest with you, in the moment you are and you come with confession on your lips, that's called repentance in the Bible. Confession. You say, God, I want to be truthful. I'm not going to lie about it, cover it up, or make excuses for it. My friend, the moment you do that, he will forgive you, he will cleanse you, and he will make you part of his family forever. And you'll be at the reunion, and there'll be a reward and you'll find a reason to take risk for Christ. Now I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat. Some of you that have never surrendered your life to Christ and some of you that have grown cold and have fallen away from God and you've just come maybe to this conference because it's your last hope. You say, well, I'll go, but I'm going to ask you to come honestly before the King. If there's someone sitting next to you today and you're not sure 
about their eternity reward, reward, and you're not sure they'll be at the reunion, but you want them to be at the reunion. My friend, don't get mad if somebody asks you to be at the reunion. They just like being with you, and they want to be with you for eternity. Would you just turn and would you ask them to come just like this young man has come? And would you get up as we all stand to our feet all over this building? In a moment, we're going to pray for our families and for our kids. I promised you we would. But first, I want those who are not sure that they are true believers, true, truly followers of Jesus, I want you to step from your seat. If you're not sure right now, would you turn and ask the person to your right or to your left, your son, your daughter, the, 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 your per, the person near you, someone around you, would you just ask them right now? Would you ask them if they're not sure? Maybe you don't even know them, but you'll ask them. Would you bring them? Would you bring them? today and if no one asks you but you know you need to come come right now come right now come right now come to the kingdom People are still coming. There's no hurry. There's no hurry this morning. We're not even scheduled to be done till one, and we're way ahead of that. There's no hurry. Come this morning. Come. Come. I just sense the battle going on in some hearts. Come. Come to his forgiveness. Come to the king who will never backhand you. He'll embrace you. He'll forgive you. He'll give you victory over the dragon, whatever it is, whatever it is. Let's pray together. Those of you standing here, would you pray right out loud? And those of you still at your seats, would you pray? And if you still need to come, just come, even as we pray. Let's pray right out loud. Jesus, we come to you. Oh, King, we come to you. We must be honest. We've made friends with the enemy. My nature has been sin. I need you to change it. Change my nature of sin to your nature. Make me like you. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Let me start brand new. Give me freedom by your power. I give you my whole being. I surrender all to you, Jesus. It's all yours. I choose to be a part of your family. I want the reward. And I want to be at the reunion. And I want my family there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus for forgiving me today. Now from all over this room, I want men who are holding unforgiveness and bitterness towards your wife, towards your kids. I, I know some of you have had some awful things happen. Some of you have gone through some very, very bitter divorces. Some of you have had your kids say awful things to you. But my friend, you've got to release it today. You've got to lay it down. You've got to say, Lord, I want to live in righteousness, and I know I can't if I hold this hatred and unforgiveness and bitterness. If that's you today, come from wherever you're at in this building and just stand with these all across the front. Come on. Come on. From wherever you're at today. From wherever you're at today. Come. Maybe it's someone that's not even part of your family. Maybe it's someone in your church. Maybe it's someone on your job. You're holding such hurt, such anger, such anger. Come from where you're at. Lay it down today. Lay it down today. Lay it down.
it down today. Thank you, Lord. from me. You chose to forgive me such heavy debt. I was a sinner, but you forgave me. You paid the price. I choose to forgive, Lord. I pay the price. I refuse to have any of this unforgiveness. Now just give it to the Lord right there. Just give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. Lay it down today. Lay it down. Lay it down today. Jesus. Now, all over this room, we're going to turn this room into a prayer room tonight, folks. We're going to turn this whole place into a prayer room. I want every one of you that has family, sons, daughters, wife, parents that are not serving God, but you desperately want to see them serve God. I want you just to hold your hand up right where you're at. Just hold them up. Look, look, look. Good. Oh, my. Oh, folks, we got to be willing to live righteous. we got to have a resolve to endure to the end. We have got to live with risk so that they would be one, so that they can be at the reunion. That is what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Come on, let's begin to cry out for them all over this room right now. Come on, let's begin to cry out for them right now. Would you just begin to pray for your kids and your wife? Would you just begin to lift their names up to the Lord? Would you just begin to lift the names of your children, your grandkids, your wife? Oh God, help me to give the gifts that count to them, Lord. Oh God. Oh Lord. Change me this week, God. Change me this week. Change me this week, oh God. 
change me, oh Lord. Change me. Change me. Oh Lord, I pray, change me, oh Lord. Change me. Change me. Change, Jason. Lord, we believe you today, oh God. We believe you today, oh God. Jesus. Jesus. Lord. Change us, Lord. Change him today, Lord. Change him today, Lord. Change him, God. Change him today, God. Change him today, Lord. Change him today, Lord. Change him today, God. Lord, we believe you. We believe you, O Lord. We believe you, O Lord. Change us today, God. Make us men of integrity, God. Oh, God, we pray. Change him today, O Lord. Oh, God. Do it, God. I do, Lord. I need your touch, Lord. 